Thank you, Mel, and good morning, everybody. Really good to see you this morning. And uh, it's uh, great to be with you. We had a little uh, Father's Day thing yesterday because quite busy today. And um, yeah, let's just say Max's artwork could use some improvement. No, off no offense to him, no offense to him, no offense to him. Um, I read um, this blog during the week uh, by uh, Paul Tripp, he's this American pastor, and he has this concept called um, functional atheism, and I just want you, to re want you to listen as I read what he says about it. He says, yes, we believe that God exists, that he created the heavens and the earth, uh, and that the Bible is accurate, and that paradise awaits, but we often live at a functional level as if there is no God. I wonder if you can relate to that at all. Um, two weeks ago, we heard this uh, verse from Psalm 14. Uh, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And it's a verse that uh, I think typifies Saul, the, the first king of Israel, um, and how he lived. And uh, as the story continues today, we see how this works itself out in his life. Uh, see, I think Saul is a functional atheist. Now, that is, he believes in God, uh, but in his day-to-day -day life, in decisions that he makes, he operates often like God doesn't exist. Now, he might believe in his mind that there is a God, but in his heart, he says there is no God. That's what we're uh, looking at, at today. Um, hopefully, yeah, this is the outline on the screen, if you want to uh, write that in your newly uh, gathered little notebook. In fact, I'm going to just give a notebook amnesty for the next three minutes. Um, so if you wanted to get up and get a notebook, no one's going to judge you in the next three minutes. If it's after that, I'm going to point at you. No, I'm not. <laughs> you can grab a notebook anytime, but please do grab one. Uh, and that's where we're going today. We're going to have a look at the story itself. Um, we're going to kind of race through it pretty quickly and then come back and see what it tells us about living as a functional atheist. So let me give you first a bit of a quick overview of where we're up to at this point as we uh, pick up in 1 Samuel 14. We've got Saul, the first king of Israel, and we've heard over the last chapters that his job um, really is to A, listen to God, that's one thing he has to do, and the other thing is he's anointed to rescue God's people from the Philistines, who are essentially kind of occupying Israel at this point. Those are the two things he's got to do. And last, uh, last chapter, uh, and the, the first half of chapter 14, Saul and the Israelite army are hard-pressed by the Philistines. And so the army has started to desert Saul um, and go and hide in the hills. And then Saul's son, Jonathan, uh, we did this last week, and his armor-bearer, they sort of secretly leave and go and attack a Philistine outpost uh, in, uh, as they trust God with that attack. And God brings this turmoil into the Philistine camp. Um, and it's at uh, this point that Saul and his guys kind of enter the fray. And it's almost comedic when they come into the Philistine camp. It says in verse 20, they found the Philistines in total confusion, striking each other with their swords. Right? So the, by the time Saul gets there, it's pretty much over. But at any rate, Saul is now in hot pursuit of the remaining Philistines. And that's where we pick up in our passage today. And so as we look at this, I want you to think about how Saul could be a functional atheist. Um, and this passage this morning starts in verse 24 and actually begins uh, with a flashback to a couple of verses earlier, to just before the army with Saul uh, are heading into the battle uh, to see what's happening over in the Philistine camp and chase after them. And so just before they go, while they're still on the other side, while they're hearing all this turmoil going on, they're thinking, what's going to happen? Saul... Uh, says this, well, uh, this is verse 24, the Israelites were in distress that day because Saul had bound the people under an oath, saying, cursed be anyone who eats food before evening comes, before I have avenged myself on my enemies. So none of the troops tasted food. Now, our translation uh, there says that the Israelites were in distress that day because Saul had bound the people under an oath. But I think actually the, the English Standard Version has this right when it says, Israel had been hard pressed that day, so Saul laid an oath on the people. That is to say, before they realized that actually the Philistines were fleeing, 
The army were hard pressed. They were wondering what was going to happen. They were scared. And so Saul makes this desperate attempt to basically keep them all with him. He doesn't trust that God's going to save like God has said, like Jonathan has trusted. He's basically operating without God in his frame of reference as a, a functional atheist. So there's this oath, Saul and the army head across, and then there's this pursuit. And so the army joins up with Jonathan and off they go and they're going through the, this forest. And would you believe it? They come into the forest and right there in the forest, there's all this honey everywhere. It's amazing. It's like something from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. It's just like, what, what is this? Amazing. And we're all really hungry. Now, Jonathan hasn't heard about the oath. He was over there trusting God in the Philistine camp. So he gratefully gobbles up some of this honey before someone pulls him aside and says, well, actually, do you know what's happened here? And Jonathan's not impressed. Jonathan says, have a look, verse 29. My father has made trouble for the country. See how my eyes brightened when I tasted a little of this honey. How much better it would have been if the men had eaten today some of the plunder they took from their enemies. Would not the slaughter of the Philistines have been even greater? So remember, the primary thing Saul's supposed to be doing, supposed to be listening to God, and he's supposed to be saving his people from the Philistines. And it seems that this oath that he's made the people swear, it's really stopped them from pursuing the Philistines. It's hamstrung the very thing he's supposed to be doing. And there are more consequences as well, because after the battle is over, the people were exhausted, understandably, given they haven't eaten anything. And so they go crazy for the food that's right there in front of them, the plunder. It seems they liked their meat very rare. They eat the meat with, with blood in it. I imagine it's kind of like that feeling you get if you know you're going to the buffet in the, in the evening and so you save yourself up for that moment. I don't know if you felt that and you, you come into the bar and you're just like, what? what's it going to be first? And then you waste yourself on fried rice or whatever it is anyway uh, it's that feeling of starvation and excitement so the people just dive in and they they eat this food they forget at that point an actual command that god has given them uh previously god has given his people a command not to eat meat with blood in it it dates back to um noah in genesis 9 it's written again in god's law in leviticus blood represents life and it's supposed to be used for atoning sacrifices and so they forget and they, they, or, or, or ignore and the people are eating all this food and then that's brought to Saul's attention. Now note, it's brought to Saul's attention. Saul doesn't realise this himself. He's functionally atheist. But he hurriedly decides, oh, uh-oh, okay, let's try to set some things right here. So he puts a place um, down to, order, uh, to slaughter the animals and to drain the blood and then he builds an altar. There's no suggestion he takes any responsibility for the foolish oath that has led the people here. Okay, so now the army has regained some energy. Uh, and in verse 36, Saul suggests, all right, let's go finish the Philistines off. So you think, okay, that's a pretty good idea from Saul. But it doesn't occur to Saul uh, until someone else suggests it, that maybe actually we should inquire of God at this point. So Saul thinks, oh, that is a good idea, actually. We probably should ask God about this. And perhaps unsurprisingly for how little Saul has thought of God throughout this chapter, God doesn't answer him that day. Saul assumes that God's non-answer is someone else's fault. He calls the people together. He says in verse 38, Let us find out what sin has been committed today. As surely as the Lord who rescues Israel lives, even if the guilt lies with my son Jonathan, he must die. And so they go through this selection process. And eventually, Jonathan is identified as the, the problem, whereas as we're reading the story, we can see that clearly there's a big problem with someone else. And so Jonathan fesses up, but his kind of sarcastic reply kind of shows the stupidity of what's going on. He says, Jonathan told him in verse 43, I tasted a little honey just with the end of my staff, and now I must die. As if to say, look, this tiny little amount of honey because of this oath I didn't even know about at the time. Yes, Dad, it makes a lot of sense that now you're going to kill me. That, that's totally, like, that's normal behaviour, isn't it? That's what he's saying. Saul's not in a joking mood. He doubles down on what he's said. And in one of the, the few references he makes to God in this chapter, he swears by God that he'll kill Jonathan, his own son. 
And at that moment, the people decide they can't go along with this stupidity anymore. So they kind of stop their begrudging obedience to Saul. And they, they sort of break their silence with this counter oath. And the people say, as surely as the Lord lives, not a hair of his head shall fall to the ground. For he did this today with God's help. All right, And there the difference between the characters is really clear. The people have got it. Jonathan has acted with God's help. Saul is a functional atheist. And then verse 46 sums up the outcome of all of this. Saul stopped pursuing the Philistines and they withdrew to their own land. See, the Philistines, that Saul was supposed to rescue the people from, they're not defeated, they're just kind of pushed back for a while. If you look down to the end of the chapter in verse 52, it says that the Philistines, that there was bitter hostility with the Philistines throughout their, Saul's whole reign. It's an opportunity missed at this moment due to Saul's foolishness. So there we have the story. And we're going to have a closer look now at some of the features of Saul's approach, a functional atheist approach, which I think we find in ourselves as well. We're going to zoom in on these three features, uh, functional atheism leading to coercive control, functional atheism, a- atheism leading to fruitless plans, and ultimately functional atheism leading to a hatred of God. So let's have a little bit more of a look at this oath that Saul lays on the people, uh, in which I think we see functional atheism leading to coercive control. Have a look at verse 24 again. I've got uh, the ESV hopefully coming up on the screen. There it is. And the men of Israel had been hard pressed that day. So Saul had laid an oath on the people saying, cursed be the man who eats food until it is evening and I am avenged on my enemies. Right? Just listen to what, Paul, uh, what Saul says there. He, he makes no mention of God, does he, in this oath? It's, it's all about him. Right? It's, it's, it's about I being avenged on my enemies, as if these aren't the people's enemies as well, or God's enemies as well. He's kind of doing what he thinks God might want, but he's kind of taken God out of the picture. You know, his, his world is focused on himself. So instead of trusting God, in that moment, Saul's approach is to manipulate the people uh, by controlling them through this oath. A threat of a curse may not seem that worrying to us, but it'd be a big deal to them, particularly if the king is involved. So that's what he does, and it doesn't work. The people might stay with him kind of physically, but they're, they're too famished to battle the Philistines. They're led uh, towards sin against God himself because they're so hungry and they, they clearly don't respect their king. Whenever he suggests something, I wonder if you noticed this in the Bible reading, the people reply with, do whatever seems best to you. As if to say, okay, I mean, you're the king, we guess, so looks like that's what we're going to be doing, but, you know, we don't love it. We can relate to Saul, though, I think. I think we can sympathise with him in this moment before we, I guess, uh, lay on him too much. You know, think about it for Saul. He's, he's terrified at this point. He's across there hearing this ruckus going on in the Philistine camp. Uh, he knows that there's way more of them than there are of him and the Israelites. Lots of his soldiers have already abandoned him. The ones who are with him are hard-pressed again, as they were in chapter 13. He's scared that they'll leave him, that he'll be be vulnerable and alone, that he'll fail. And so in that moment, he's got the choice to trust God, but he tries to coerce his way out. Don't we know what that feels like? I think that's how we automatically respond a lot of the time in situations of stress for us. Much of the time, it's good things that we want, but we try to kind of grasp at them, to to wrangle them for ourselves rather than trusting. So, for instance, we know God has designed us as social beings, you know, to enjoy uh, each other, be interdependent uh, on Him and with others. That's a good thing. We want that. But it's so easy to grab that good thing and take God out of the picture, Try to control it ourselves. Maybe it's in putting your hopes for relational fulfillment on one person, on maybe a good friend or a partner. 
Uh, you end up demanding way more of them than they can deliver. They're putting all this pressure on them. We want them to fulfill us. Or with God kind of relegated to the edge of our thinking sometimes, you, you tend to see relationships all kind of formed around you, about my needs and my feelings. You hold people a little bit to ransom because unless you get what you want, you're going to be in a, maybe in a bad mood. Uh, so people say to you, do, do whatever seems best to you. Or maybe it's in how we relate to, to kids or grandkids, right? You long so much for them to be healthy uh, and happy, good things, right? And for them even to know and trust Jesus, also a great thing. But the temptation with that desire is then to control things. Perhaps you can coerce them into faith. And when things seem a little out of control, you end up getting either you know, disproportionately angry about something or you want to strike fear into them or you put in harsh rules to control. Okay, they say timidly, do whatever seems best to you. Because it's about my reputation and my sanity. Or, and I think this one, I think it, this same thing even happens in, um, in church sometimes um, or often. I think it's something I need to be lots more conscious of. You know, if you're, you're involved in something at church, you think, well, that's intrinsically about God, right? But it's still easy to forget him. Perhaps we long for a, a ministry or a team that we're part of um, or an event we're doing to be a, a success. So we, we guilt people into coming or to helping. Perhaps when things aren't done quite as we would wish or things just aren't how we'd like them at church. You feel kind of personally aggrieved and try to control things by maybe, you know, spreading negative talk. See, that's not trust in God. I think, I think that's a functional atheism. God's not in the picture in that moment. You're not leaving things with him. You're trying to control them. It's just you. It's just me. Well, that's, I think, the first feature of where we see functional atheism lead. The second feature, this is a shorter one, is... Uh, having God as essentially an afterthought in your plans. You can see in verse 36, Saul says, let us go down and pursue the Philistines by night and plunder them till dawn and let us not leave one of them alive. Do whatever seems best to you, they replied. But the priest said, let us inquire of God here. Right, so now it's kind of the 11th hour. The battle in many respects is already over. God's already won. The Philistines are all but cleaned up. Saul finally decides to get involved and then he thinks when prompted by the priest to ask God whether his, uh, that is Saul's plans, are a good idea. So that, that's functional atheism for Saul. He is part of God's plan but he's sort of taken God out of it. He's sort of planning as if God doesn't exist. But I think that's what we often tend to do as well. We live as if it's not God who's given us every single good thing. It's not God who gives us life itself. We live as if the, the future will just unroll like we plan it. I wonder if you know that dynamic yourself. It's like in, in James chapter 4, um, and just let me read verse 14. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. I mean, that, that's the reality, but we live as if we're in control. So we make big picture plans about life and, and jobs and careers and, um, and, and other things. We make little plans about what we're going to do just today or tomorrow. Uh, and then we might, if reminded, ask God to bless those plans once we've made them. Right? We live, I think, as functional atheists sometimes. God doesn't answer Saul that day. It's really no surprise because Saul's been operating like God doesn't exist. So we come to our, our, our final feature of functional atheism. And this might seem kind of extreme, but I think this is where it leads. It leads towards an actual hatred of God's work, of the one who God is working through. See, Saul's functional atheism might not seem too bad when we look at those kind of first two kind of features, but I just think bit by bit, we get to the end of this chapter and we see Saul making an attempt to kill his own son. You just think, well, how did it get to this? I don't know if it's a, an appropriate passage for Father's Day. I don't know what Father's Day would have looked like in that household. 
But he gets to this point, and he's not only he's he's crazy. He's got wants to kill his own son there, and not only it's it's not only his own son. It's the only character who has been kind of a shining beacon for trust in God, who's actually brought victory for the Israelites. And so Saul is jealous of Jonathan. He's angry at his situation. He's stubborn. He's too blind to realize his own responsibility in all of it. And so he tries to pin it on Jonathan. It's, it's craziness. But I think this is where functional atheism leads. It's the impulse, I think, of our own hearts. It might sound extreme, but if we're living functionally without God in our day-to-day life, if we are living that way, then we don't want to hear that God, you know, exists and, and is kind of involved in our lives. We don't want to hear that he's working. We don't want to hear that he's doing things without us, that we're not the be-all and end-all. We don't want to be shown that we've been wrong. And I think it's the same impulse that led people to put to death the ultimate picture of God's work in the world, the one who ultimately trusted in him, Jesus himself. So if you think this story, if you look at this story and you think Saul's response at the end in wanting to kill Jonathan is like wild and crazy, just think of how insane it is that people wanted to kill Jesus. How could the one who God so clearly worked through, who healed, who taught, who called out hypocrisy, commanded storms to be still, how could people, how could people want him dead? That's, that's crazy. I think this is where functional atheism leads and if we're honest I think our own hearts are like Saul's I think we've seen that but I think they're also like the Pharisees in Jesus day like Pilate like those in the crowd who called out crucify him I think naturally we're so twisted that we would even kill the son of God we think that that would set us free but unlike Jonathan in this story Jesus isn't rescued by the mob the hairs on his head were surrounded by a crown of thorns and soaked in blood he was put to death by Pilate by the crowd by Saul by us yet he absorbed all that jealousy and the stubbornness and the anger and the hardness of heart that put him there and he 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 dealt with it he rose from the dead And he offers those who wanted him dead a second chance. So I think as we we recognise how we're like Saul, how we've already been like him in the past, because I think reading that, I think that that I've been in situations when I'm like that. I think if we know ourselves at all, we we kind of recognise that this is how we'll be in the future as well. I think as we recognise that, we are reminded of how much we need Jesus and his grace the one who takes our hatred and then rises from the dead anyway. That's true for everyone here this morning. It's true for those who've never trusted him before. And I hope if that's you today, you can see how much you need to, that living as any kind of atheist. It just means really grasping at control that you actually don't have, making fruitless plans. It's it's doomed and it's painful. And for those uh, who have trusted him before who are living for him I hope that you're reminded of just how much you needed him and I hope this is an encouragement to see these moments of functional atheism in ourselves more and more admitting those uh, obvious ways we stuff up yes and also perhaps seeing it in pockets of our lives that we've not really thought about much in relation to God see the fool says in his heart there is no God the truth is there is a God There is a God who is good. There's a God who saves. He saved through Jonathan, even even through Saul, and he saves through Jesus. And I hope that that reality, that reality reassures us of how good he is, how much he wants good for us, and how worthy of trusting uh, in each moment he is. And I hope that as we reflect on that, as that sinks into us more deeply, that will break into our daily consciousness more and more and we'd not be functional atheists how we live anymore let's let's pray our father we are sorry that 
um, yeah, just even to our own detriment, we, we often um, ignore and reject you and your work in our lives. And actually that we, we ultimately re- reject you and reject your son. Thank you so much that he died for us, uh, not just because of us, but for us uh, to give us another go. Lord, please be with us. Be with us by your spirit and in your word. Uh, Be with us in our decisions, in our moment by moment, and help us to trust Jesus. Amen.